Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. We know how uh, the greatest gift that you can give to us is your time, and we certainly appreciate you uh, tuning in uh, for our live chat today. Uh, let me uh, begin uh, with an apology. I know that we had planned on uh, getting together last week, Wednesday, uh, for a live chat with our Vice President for Student Affairs, Aaron Hoffman Harding, due to a surge earlier that week in our COVID-19 numbers, uh, cases with students, uh, she became pretty all consumed uh, by the response to that crisis. And we had to uh, last minute cancel uh, that interview. We will find a different time in the coming weeks to bring Aaron here before you and, uh, and be able to respond to some questions and, and to provide updates uh, for, for all of you. I thought before we um, interview and, and, and talk with our distinguished professor uh, today, uh, Christina Walbrecht, is we, I should give you just a little bit of an update in terms of what's going on uh, on campus with regard to our COVID-19 situation. Uh, the surge in numbers uh, last week uh, led uh, Father John on Tuesday evening uh, to uh, cancel in-person classes and move over the next uh, couple of weeks, at least, to um, a remote classroom experience. And we also work to try to um, close down, quiet down the campus as much as possible. So um, for the last uh, um, week now, a uh, week ago Wednesday, um, no on-campus students have been permitted to go off campus and no on off campus students have been permitted on. All classes have been virtual uh, during that period of time and will continue uh, for the coming days. In uh, total candor, um, we were not fully prepared uh, to see the, the spread of the virus uh, and uh, to be able to uh, respond uh, to the numbers of students uh, who were infected uh, early on. Um, that initial surge uh, at first kind of bottlenecked uh, the COVID-19 hotline, uh, the calls that students were getting, were having trouble getting through. And then when we ironed that out, um, we had challenges with the numbers that were at the testing center. As we worked that out, then we had to, um, to work hard uh, to make sure that we were providing the proper care and support uh, to, uh, to our students who were being placed in isolation if they tested positive or placed in quarantine uh, rooms if they were uh, in the contact tracing uh, circles. So um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that at this point, uh, we have made a very significant progress on all those fronts. Uh, and, and a lot of those initial uh, kinks have been ironed out where I would be, uh, um, it would not be fair for me to say that we're 100% we're there, um, but we've made dramatic, dramatic progress. And uh, I'm, I'm really pleased by what I'm hearing are the gains. On a personal note, uh, our daughter, uh, who is a sophomore here at Notre Dame, uh, tested positive uh, for COVID-19 in that early surge. And so as parents, um, we experienced through our daughter some of those initial challenges, difficulty in getting through the switchboard, um, difficulty to getting that initial test, then getting into isolation and, uh, and difficult um, getting the support in that the first 24 hours that she was there. I can say that through her experiences, we saw things uh, quickly pick up and the care and the concern and the compassion that was extended to her um, uh, after that, the, those, those initial days has been tremendous. Uh, she just uh, got out of um, isolation yesterday. Uh, so it was really good to lay a set of eyes on her. And like most cases uh, on campus, she experienced uh, flu-like symptoms, uh, nothing that was severe enough where we had to worry about any hospitalization or anything like that. So I have a, a bit of a sense of what many parents are going through right now although each case is different and some certainly are more severe and, uh, and trigger other uh, issues uh, that uh, I don't mean in any way to, to minimize. Um, 
Fortunately, we've made, as I said, significant progress. We have streamlined these processes and we have taken staff from different unit, units across campus and, and have them working now full-time uh, as assisting at the, on the phone centers uh, and in the testing centers, and then providing the care and concern uh, through the quarantine and, uh, and the isolation phases. We have about 75 members of our development and alumni association team now that uh, for the past 10 days have been working full-time in those areas. And there's many, many others across campus who um, gladly have stepped up and, and are providing the support that is necessary. Um, to date, um, my understanding is that we've had less than a, a handful of students who have sought out um, a hospital visit, um, beginning with an ER. I, I believe there was only one student who um, was um, admitted overnight, released the next day. Um, we've had no apparent cases to date of faculty being infected in the classroom. Uh, we have stepped up surveillance testing uh, on campus. The last few days we've tested um, a thousand students and we have just extended test testing in the last day uh, to uh, faculty and staff as well. Um, the, the encouraging news is we've had a 1.1% uh, positivity rate uh, among the surveillance uh, testing, but, but overall positive cases um, or the positivity rate, while the positive cases have declined substantially from last week's peaks, um, the overall positivity rate is still too high at 12.2%. Uh, and we're encouraged though that it continues to trend downward and we're monitoring that very closely, taking none of that uh, for granted whatsoever. I believe that on campus students are taking uh, the safety protocols um, more seriously than, than ever, including those students that are living off campus. Um, it's been a sobering experience, I think, for everyone involved uh, up front. Um, I, I believe that students are following the heightened protocols and um, they're really policing uh, one another. Uh, so uh, really kudos to our students for the way that they've responded and uh, both on campus and off campus uh, to date. The vast majority of them wanna be here on campus. They want to return to in-person classes. And so this is motivating them to follow the protocols to see if, uh, if we can sustain what is that Notre Dame educational model uh, amidst uh, these very, very challenging times. Um, one of the big concerns continues to be uh, the mental health uh, issues for our students. This is a time with whether students are on campus or, or not, anybody who's predisposed to anxiety and depression, um, other mental health issues, uh, they're certainly exacerbated. And uh, the, the care teams are trying to check in uh, a couple of times a day with our students and look in after them and, uh, and, and provide whatever support possible. Certainly the, the lack of connectivity and the isolation is making matters only uh, more challenging on that front. There are different opinions. And I understand that people in this time, people of goodwill, uh, are going to disagree on how this matter, you know, should be handled. I would say, as Father John has echoed, COVID-19 is a formidable foe. At the same time, I, I want you to know that we're in the trenches right now and we're fighting the fight uh, to the very best of our abilities and trying to be adaptable and make the right decisions um, as, uh, as, as the situation calls for it. So I'd ask you just to please keep us in your prayers uh, that, um, that, that we have the serenity uh, to, uh, to, um, to make the right calls um, and to accept what we cannot uh, control and to have the wisdom to know the difference as that prayer goes. But we need, count on your prayers, but especially for our students and the most vulnerable among them uh, is, uh, it will be deeply, deeply appreciated. So it's my pleasure now uh, uh, to introduce to you uh, our, uh, our, our faculty uh, guest today. Um, uh, we actually invited her two months ago uh, to speak today because um, she is one of the world's leading experts on the issue of women's suffrage. And today is actually 
the centennial anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which uh, guaranteed and uh, protected the right of women to vote. So we couldn't think of a better day uh, to have Professor Christina Wolbrecht on uh, the program here uh, to share some thoughts with us about her work uh, as, uh, as a professor in the Department of Political Science. She is also the director of the prestigious Francis and Kathleen Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy. And she is also the Robert and Margaret Hanley Family Director of the Notre Dame Washington Program in Washington, DC. So um, without further ado, thank you for joining us, uh, Christina. And maybe you could just start out and give us a little bit of your background. Where, where did you grow up and how, where did you find the inspiration to want to become a professor of political science? Uh, so thanks, Lou. It's really a pleasure to be here um, on this day and to have this opportunity to talk about uh, suffrage with you. Um, I actually grew up in Portland, Oregon. Uh, although I have to say my, my father's from Missouri and my mom is from Southern Indiana. So um, uh, to a certain extent, there's, there's some coming home here. Um, I grew up in a family that I'm guessing isn't that different than, than many of the viewers today in that a lot of political discussion around the dining, dining room table and a lot of talk about how we connected our values, um, I grew up in a religious household, um, to our sort of work in the broader world. Um, and so I was always fascinated by politics from a really young age. Uh, and my plan, my goal was uh, uh, to run political campaigns that I was going to get through college and I was going to be, you know, a campaign manager and all the excitement. Uh, and in my junior year, I did what many of our students do. I now direct our Washington program and I spent a semester in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I always tell my students it was the most important semester um, of college for me. And what I learned is that I like learning and writing and talking about politics more than I like doing it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I came back from that with a sense of, okay, maybe that's not my path. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what I, the part of the story I love to tell for Notre Dame is um, that program, I was, I was going to a program through American University, which is how our Notre Dame students used to do a Washington program. And so the very first Notre Dame and St. Mary's students I ever met were in that program. Uh, one of my best uh, girlfriends from that from that trip was a St. Mary's student. And so that was sort of my first connection to Notre Dame uh, before I ran off to graduate school and then found myself here. Fantastic. So um, if you would, um, to bring this up to date a little bit, what has it been like to teach during a pandemic? Um, oh. You've had, you just came, the reason why we started at 1235 today is you were concluding a class today on women's suffrage, right? At 1230. Yep. Yep. And uh, tell us, I think you've got some stuff still up on the whiteboard behind you. Yeah, uh, if they go to the, the white screen again, you'll see um, we are all learning new talents and skills. So this is actually my iPad uh, for this class. Um, sometimes I sit at my computer with two screens and I have PowerPoint up and the students can see me. Um, sometimes I'm actually writing on a whiteboard um, as I would be doing in the classroom. Um, so obviously there's a lot of anxiety and, and challenges as, as you were just talking about, Lou. Um, I, I have to say, it's really been impressive though, the way that um, the, a whole lot of units on campus have really risen to the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, all of us have had to learn so much about technology and uh, how to deliver lectures virtually and how to record them. And I, I just cannot say enough about our IT people and the amazing job that they've done. The facilities folks, I'm not surprised that there haven't been any infections related to classroom space. It's so well designed and, and, and so many precautions. And so um, it's been really hard, but it's been made a lot easier by that kind of support. That's great. That's really good to hear. Um, this is, has to be a crazy semester because you start in in-person <laughs> classes, then you on the fly adjust to, um, to the virtual um, uh, mode and uh, with the hope that maybe we'll get back to in-person classes. How do you navigate that? Is you see a real difference between the two modalities? So what I think is that um, I think most faculty, and I would certainly agree that that in person remains, you know, what we want and sort of our ideal point. Um, and I, I'm grateful that I was able to meet in person with my students before we went back online. Mm -hmm. That being said, I think one of the very thin little silver linings, and I, I want to, you know, recognize the, the very real challenges. But the silver lining is 
by investing in all of this technology and these experiences, I do feel like there's going to be dividends we pay sort of down the road. Mm -hmm. um, but I've learned uh, new skills and new things that are going to improve my teaching going forward. Um, and I guess the other thing I'd say is that there's a real sense of we're all in this together. And so the number one message I have given my own students is we have to be really flexible with each other. We have to have lots of communication that the number one thing I care about is you being safe. And after that, I care about you learning something. And so the students have, you know, been flexible with me when maybe things weren't quite done on time or I was recording lectures from my home. Um, yeah. And I've tried to be as flexible as I can for them. And, you know, I've had students affected by this. And so we're just trying to work together to, to do what we can. Yeah. So tell, tell us, how did you, um, how did you come to Notre Dame and what, uh, what's kept you here? Because you've been here for roughly 20 years. You look far too young uh, for that. But, but, you know, sincerely, tell, tell us a little bit about uh, how we got you here to Notre Dame and what's kept you here for this long. Oh, yes. Obviously, I finished my PhD when I was six, um, and <laughs> how I've been here um, for such a long time. So um, when you get a PhD, it's really a, 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 certainly a national, if not an international sort of a market. And um, Notre Dame had a job description that really fit the kind of work I did, um, that really cared about representation. It wanted someone who understood political institutions, but also the behavior of people. Um, you know, when you're coming out of grad school, you're so, you just, any sort of job. But there's a reason I've been here. This is going to be my 24th year teaching at wow. Notre Dame um, mm -hmm. for such a long time. And, and that's because I cannot, <laughs> frankly, it's just hard to beat the combination of things we have on this campus. So I get to teach really smart, really engaged students who, who care about these issues and, and want to learn more, mm -hmm. um, which just is a pleasure um, at a place that still really cares about teaching and it invests in it and, and, and really wants to have a, a, a really vibrant experience for students. So my students who have great ideas can get funding for their research or for their travel um, and really get sort of an extra level of, of educational experience there. And then for me as a scholar, um, to be in a department with so many smart, active scholars who are doing exciting research and to be frankly in an ambitious university that wants to always push to be better. Um, okay. I always say I came to Notre Dame and um, their ambition means my ambition that, that mm -hmm. you know, we want, we want faculty to succeed. We want them to, to do their research. We want them to have an impact in the world. And I just can't really find anywhere else I want to go that has quite that, that, uh, that combination. That's great. Well, we're fortunate uh, uh, to have, uh, have had you here for 24 years and hopefully, hopefully many more years to come. So, so it's the, the centennial anniversary of the, ninth, the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Tell us a little bit about your research on women's suffrage in the United States and what might be some things about uh, women's suffrage that we take for granted or that we wouldn't readily know. So um, I, I appreciate the question. And obviously this is, uh, I, as I like to say, this brief shining moment of, of real research uh, relevance, which is a, a great <laughs> deal of fun um, for me as a scholar. And um, my interest was first in sort of women voters immediately after suffrage. And you would think, my God, it's been a hundred years. Uh, why don't we know more about them? Um, yeah. But the truth is, um, uh, as you're probably aware, men and women don't put pink and blue ballots into ballot boxes. And so mm -hmm. the only way we really know how men and women vote um, is by asking them how they voted mm -hmm. in surveys. And in the 20s and the 30s, we just really do not have good, reliable surveys to do that work, that research. And so I got really engaged in some in-depth uh, work using census data and, and polling books. Uh, you can probably see behind me, I have some presidential Barbies. This is my presidential Barbie collection. I want you to know that these are uh, actually uh, utilitarian. Um, what they're hiding from you is stacks of poll books and, and census <laughs> reports uh, that went into that research. So my research really starts the next day. It starts tomorrow after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, trying to understand what then have women done with the vote? How can we understand women voters and their contributions to our democracy and our democratic system? Yeah, that's fascinating. And what might be some of the conclusions that you've been able to derive from maybe the early, you know, suffrage of, of women in the 20s and 30s? So one of the reasons we wrote the second book uh, that came mm -hmm. out this year, A Century of Votes for Women, is, is we were actually struck by how much continuity there is across this 100-year period. 
in the ways that the press and politicians talk about women voters uh, in terms of our expectation for women voters, um, et cetera. And so one of the things I would really emphasize is that um, the 19th Amendment is only a first step, right? So the 19th Amendment prohibits by uh, discrimination on the basis of sex in voting rights. It didn't, for example, get rid of Jim Crow practices in the American South in the 20s. And so for black women, it's really gonna be until 1965 and the Voting Rights Act for the 19th Amendment to be real for them. Mm -hmm. But we see, and we see that in other places as well where um, states really varied in how excited they were to sort of integrate women voters. Um, and so some states had um, Oh, extra registration days and, and uh, set up things at state fairs so women could learn how to vote. And other states, uh, let's just say, were less accommodating. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we see that today as we're looking at, at different um, uh, states and their approaches to, say, the challenge of voting uh, during a pandemic, for example. Right, right. And let's do, definitely get to that. Is it fair to talk about the women's vote? Um, as if it is kind of one block. Uh, my guess is that um, there are women who vote very differently uh, for very different reasons. But um, it, how do you how do you talk about the women's vote in general? I think there's a lot of interest, or at least there has been among politicians who want to win elections um, yeah. since 1920 in trying to understand the woman voter, right? Who, yeah. who is she? What, what are the things that we need to say uh, to get the woman voter on our side? And yeah. as you already suggested, um, uh, Lou, this is, this is impossible. There really is no such thing as the woman voter. And that's because yeah. um, women are, and I know my, everyone will be shocked to hear this, as diverse in their interests and identities as men are, right? So there are progressive women and there are more conservative women and there are women of every different um, uh, religious tradition. There are women of different ethnic and, and racial backgrounds. There are women um, in, in, in different social classes with different levels of educational attainment. All these things that shape our life experiences, that shape our perceptions about what we want out of politics. And so we absolutely see that um, as being true of women. It doesn't mean we haven't tried to come up with the woman voter. Um, right. and, and we definitely see over time that sort of persistent talk about, um, and, and usually the women voter is a mother. Uh, so lots of assumptions that in the 20s, in the 50s, and to today, when we talk about soccer moms, uh, right. that sort of that's, that's really a dominant way in which women um, relate to politics. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so sort of pulling between the rhetoric and the reality is, is one of our jobs as social scientists. In, in, in recent history, would, is it fair to say that um, women voters participate, turn out at a higher rate than, than male voters? Yeah, so one of the stories of the last 100 years is a dramatic shift on that. So mm -hmm. certainly uh, when women entered the electorate in the 20s and earlier in some Western states, women were less likely to vote than men were. Only about a third of women uh, turned out to vote in uh, 1920, for example, when something like 70% of men turned out to vote. Okay. Um, and, and really, um, we, we see in there sort of the longstanding impact of, of um, I'm sorry, my lights just went off because I'm doing what the people said to do and I'm not moving. And we're in, a, <laughs> we're in a very beautiful lead building now and it means if I don't move, my lights turn off. Um, I'm gonna, <laughs> nonetheless, um, it's a beautiful brand new building. Um, yeah. and we love it, but these are the consequences. Um, so what I wanted to you're, say- is, You're in Jenkins Nanavik Hall. I'm in Jenkins right? Nanavik Hall. Uh, yeah. I'm looking out at Deepak right now out of my window. So uh, we're doing the best we can. Got it. Um, and, and the, it's a gorgeous day here in South Bend, so I'm getting lots of sun that way. Um, so, um, and a lot of this is really the long-standing impact of suffrage exclusion, that if you don't have the opportunity to get the habit of voting uh, at a young age, when you come a political age, you are less likely to vote throughout your entire life. And so really the story of the last hundred years is as older women exit, uh, one way we say that, uh, the electorate and, and younger women socialize differently come into it to see voting as really part of their duty. Right. Um, right. By 1980, women were more likely to vote than men, and that has uh, persisted to this day. It persists across racial groups, ethnic groups, uh, any kind of identity that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. what, when you think about the celebration of the centennial of the 19th Amendment, and then we think about our current political and really very challenging reality to yeah. today. What is its relevance? 
today. And, and, and there's, our, again, um, with a presidential election on the horizon, much talk about the women vote. How do you, how do you take the work that you have done, the research that you've done, and, and add it to um, the significance of the moment? So um, this has been a really exciting opportunity for me because as you said, the Centennial has generated all this support and interest and it's really been a great opportunity for those of us who study these things to engage with the public um, and sort of play that role, not just on campus, where as you said, I'm teaching a whole class on suffrage, um, but more broadly. And I think I would emphasize um, three things in particular. One, we've already sort of touched on. Um, all the 19th Amendment says is you can't prohibit on the basis of sex. We don't really actually have an affirmative right to vote in the United States. The government, it's not the government's responsibility to make sure that you can cast a ballot. And we're seeing that today in discussions about absentee and online voting, in-person voting, different voter ID laws, all these sorts of questions. And so um, voting rights remain contested and are, and are something every generation really has to grapple with. Mm -hmm. um, when we think about why women were denied the, lack, uh, the right to vote for such a long time, we get at some pretty fundamental ideas about what politics is um, and, and what sort of values and um, uh, abilities we associate with politics, independence, strength, maybe even domination, um, mm -hmm. and what we expect sort of roles for men and women. And so um, thinking about this year where we have more women running for office, we have more women um, as sort of major party candidates really makes us, you know, brings back these very fundamental ideas. And I've, I've written about how sort of the same sorts of arguments that, that were against women voting, we still see when we talk about women candidates, for example. And so all of that, I think, remains um, um, really relevant um, as well. And the right. final is, you know, the appeal to, as you said, the woman voter. We, we still, 100 years later, are trying to figure out who she is uh, and how we can get her on our side. Yeah, and it, would it be fair to say that um, the Me Too movement, which uh, which emerged um, largely in response to um, uh, the sexual um, repression of women and, and assaults and, and so forth, has led to more and more female candidates at all levels of government, running at local and and uh, and state and and national levels. Is that? Is that changing the role of women in the, the electoral process, do you think? So yeah, the last you know five or six years have really been fascinating for thinking about gender politics in a lot of ways. And I guess I would point out how gendered so many of these movements have been. So absolutely, you mentioned Me Too. Um, I, would, I would go back to the Women's March right after uh, Trump's uh, inauguration in, in 2017, right? It was called a Women's March. Um, the focus on gun violence and gun control in the United States has often been led by groups like Moms Demand Action, right? That, that women play this particular sort of um, caring, supportive, compassionate role um, that they've always been expected to play in their families, but they're also now stretching out and, and really see that as their role in the, in the community as large. And that's, and I don't wanna be clear, that's been true since before suffrage, but we're right. definitely seeing that these days. You're absolutely right that, that um, those movements have inspired some women to say, I'm gonna run myself, but we also see a bandwagon effect there where no matter the issues you care about, as women see other women in political roles, they can sort of imagine themselves doing that. So uh, I've written a lot about suffrage, but I also have another line of work with my colleague, uh, Dave Campbell, who's chair of the political science department, where we've looked at the impact of having women run for office on the political engagement and interest of young girls. Mm -hmm. um, and so we see that as well, each generation sort of seeing themselves as being able to step into having influence in the political arena. Great. Well, Christina, you wear uh, um, many hats here at the <laughs> university, right? And, and one is as the director of the Rooney Center for American Democracy, uh, which has just been a, a, a wonderful addition uh, over the last decade uh, plus uh, in, in being able to um, bring the, the impact of kind of American democracy to our students and really to motivate them to get more engaged in the democratic you know, process here in, in the States. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the work of the Rooney Center and its broader reach? Yeah, um, you know, speaking about reasons that I've stayed at Notre Dame all this time. 
um, yeah. this is this is certainly on that list. So the Bernie Center was um, uh, established more than 10 years ago now, as, as you just said, uh, as a result of a really generous and forward thinking uh, grant from uh, Francis and Kathleen Rooney um, to establish this center to help us hire faculty, to help us do programming, um, and so many uh, other activities that are really central to our mission, which is to advance the study and the understanding of American democracy on this campus, but also in the broader world, that our research and that our students will go out and have those sorts of impacts. And so um, what does that mean? It means that um, uh, through faculty hires, we're now one of the leading places, maybe the leading place in the country to think about the role of religion in American politics. We have an incredible cohort of faculty who look at race and ethnicity, particularly the growing Latino population and their impact on American politics. We are able to have events that sort of bring the political world to students on campus. So for example, we hosted a debate in spring of 2019 between uh, former secretaries of state Condoleezza Rice and John Kerry, right? Mm -hmm. These sorts of really exciting experiences for our students. And then we're able to support students. Um, we're one of sort of the main sponsors of ND Votes, which is a student-led group on campus that does voter mobilization and voter education. Mm -hmm. And we've sort of become the brand. If you just want to sort of have a place where you can really discuss things that are happening in elections and sort of learn about them, mm -hmm. um, uh, our pizza pop and politics nights um, uh, are really popular for that as well. And so um, this has just been a fantastic opportunity to sort of expand what we're doing in the classroom more broadly. That's fantastic. It, you know, it it, um, it seems like, I don't know if we, people say that, but it seems like we're on the verge of an historic uh, presidential election and things could not be more politically, emotionally charged, it seems, uh, in the country and certainly in recent decades. And again, people of goodwill are on both sides of, of the aisle. Um, I remember, I believe it was a quote from Albert Camus, the French uh, um, philosopher who said the role of an intellectual is to, and this was during the Algerian war, he said is to calm fanaticisms and disintoxicate minds. Uh, what role would the, the, the Rooney Center and our political science department more broadly do for our students today to try to calm some of the fanaticisms, to disintoxicate minds and help them to be responsible members of, of a democratic uh, tradition. So I'm going to steal that from you entirely, Lou. So thank you for that. That's going to be very useful going forward. <laughs> um, I, this is absolutely an important role um, uh, for the political science department and also for our specific engagement with students on campus. Um, so with events, for example, like the Cary and um, uh, 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 Rice debate is I had so many students whose feedback was it was so great to hear people from two different sides who sort of appreciate each other, could identify where they disagree, identify where they agree, and try to find some common ground, which was, you know, really the emphasis of that night. Right. Um, it's really important to know that, you know, in our classes, um, our jobs aren't to tell students what to believe. Our student, our jobs are to give students tools so that they can be informed and effective citizens, that they can learn about and understand the political world around them and then take those values, all those ideas and, and things they're learning throughout their Notre Dame experience and really bring them out into their communities. And certainly one of those values is valuing every human being, listening to others, um, trying to find ways for cooperation and, and collaboration. Um, that means that lots of us, I know in my own assignments, are always asking my students, you know, go out, study a political issue, study a political candidate, and bring these tools that, that you're sort of, we're discussing in our classes to these sorts of questions. I also want to say a word about our students um, who run ND Votes. They have been just amazing in their commitment to engaging their fellow students in a sort of safe space to have these debates, in choosing the issues students want to learn about. Uh, they also spent this summer creating their own uh, website about um, uh, absentee ballots. So most of our students vote absentee in the cities and states where they live. Um, and our students have done this just spectacular job of putting together a resource for other students so that they can participate and make sure that their voice is being heard. That's terrific. Let me, let me ask you uh, um, a very hot topic question, if I could. It actually um, comes to us from... Uh, uh, one of our viewers, and um, the question is uh, from George Malinsky, 
how concerned should we be in this election about either one, voter fraud, or two, voter suppression? So I, I want to recognize that I'm not going to tell anybody anything that they don't already know, that those are, are really, have become really, part, regretfully, really partisan um, concerns and, and partisan issues. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say that as a precursor to my answer, which is um, um, my response to that is, is really based on what I know about research done in political science, some of it here on our own campus, uh, but my own scholarship and, 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 and the work of social scientists who have looked extremely carefully at these issues because the very reason you asked the question, they're so important to the functioning of American democracy, right? Making sure that we have free and fair elections. Right. Um, political scientists have looked extensively at the issue of voter fraud. There is virtually no evidence that, that voter fraud happens and certainly not at a level that would affect the outcome um, of elections. Very rarely people vote somewhere that they're not registered or um, uh, you know, under a, a wrong or confused name. That's usually not a purposeful act. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, a, it's an error, uh, mm -hmm. that it's a human error. Um, and so um, we do have extensive laws in this country, much more actually than many other advanced, uh, uh, advanced industrial democracies. Mm -hmm. um, about who can vote and registration and all these sorts of things. Um, but the reality is um, our, our problem is actually the other one. We wanna bring more people uh, for a functioning democracy. We should be more concerned that our, our rates of voting of turnout are so much lower than many other countries. Um, uh, right. It's not that people are so excited to vote that they're doing it 10 or 12 times or if they're not qualified. Mm -hmm. Voter suppression on the other hand um, is, a, is a pretty real problem. Um, we know that um, any barriers we put up, so um, the way I tell this to my students is, uh, you could go out and be one vote out of a thousand and probably not make a difference, or you could sit at home and watch Netflix. Uh, and, and the truth is, um, for a lot of Americans, sitting at home and watching Netflix is, is more attractive. Mm -hmm. I know that to go vote, I had to have made sure I didn't get purged from an earlier list or I have to provide an identification I might not already have um, naturally mm -hmm. in my everyday life. If I'm worried someone's gonna challenge my immigration status, mm -hmm. um, I'm probably less likely to take that effort to make mm -hmm. it to a polling place. And so um, there is real concern um, about just ensuring that people who do wanna vote can vote and that their votes can be uh, uh, counted. Got it. You're also the Hanley Family Director of the Washington DC uh, program. And can you tell us a little bit more about, obviously it was very influential in your own formation yes. uh, to have that D semester in DC. Can you tell us a little bit about the nature uh, of the program uh, currently here at Notre Dame and what the vision of, of it is going forward? So this is one of my favorite things to be associated with at Notre Dame. Um, and, and I should say the level of our students in uh, the level of engagement of our students in sort of wanting to understand politics and be engaged in it is really high and it's only become higher in recent years. I have never had so much students coming by my office and just saying, you said this thing in class and I wanna understand what's happening in my own community before. And the Washington uh, program is a really great opportunity for that. So um, we send 16 students each fall and each spring um, to Washington DC where they live, take classes and work in our nation's capital. Um, and so, uh, right, I should say, um, I, I want to say Trafalgar Square, but that would be another Notre Dame facility. <laughs> They're on DuPont Circle, uh, on DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, the first thing I want to emphasize is these aren't just political science majors. We send students who want to intern um, uh, in arts institutions, who intern uh, for major financial institutions or for uh, the departments of treasury, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we have students who do intern on the Hill or with political organizations. And so for a range of our students, this is a really fantastic opportunity for what it was for me, which is career mm -hmm. discernment. Right? Mm -hmm. They get an opportunity. They also develop networks. We put them in touch with um, Notre Dame alumni in our nation's capital, who are always so enthusiastic about uh, interacting with our students. They're also taking classes. Um, our own Carlos Lozada, an, a Notre Dame graduate and a Pulitzer, recent Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, is at the Washington Post. He teaches an extremely popular political journalism class. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we offer other classes as well. And so it's 
it's just a really exciting opportunity for our students both to grow as people and and in, in their intellectual development but also to do some really important career discernment what kind of work do i like to do so the um i don't know if it came as a disappointment but for 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 different reasons we were going to be the, the host site of the, the first presidential debate uh, at the end of September. And uh, with that, um, uh, many eyes would be uh, from around the world um, looking at Notre Dame, um, largely due to kind of COVID-19 protections and, and some of the changes in the way the debate would be administered, very limited access to, to any students on campus. Um, Notre Dame chose to kind of forego the, the debate this year. Um, Father John continues to be on the Presidential Debate Commission and has been for many years. Um, was that a missed opportunity from um, the, the Rooney Center the, of, of American Democracy per perspective? Uh, how, how are students disappointed? How do you look to keep our students really active and, and, and focused on the electoral process? So I would definitely say that both our faculty and our students are, are disappointed just because it really was an opportunity by having this light on Notre Dame and, and this sort of um, focusing event um, to do a lot of student engagement and to do a lot of faculty expertise to sort of um, show ourselves um, to the world. And you've exactly put your you know, sort of finger on it. What, what we're trying to do is ask ourselves now, um, we had all these plans for engaging students in the debate and we were talking about doing some short TED talks and we wanted students to, to have chances to develop um, you know, short videos about what they were looking for in the debate, all these other sorts of uh, engagement opportunities. And now the challenge is to say, okay, that didn't happen. Um, yeah. But we still have students who are engaged and interested in this process. And so we can still watch debates, even if they're not happening over in the Jack. And we can still um, engage in, in, uh, in voter education. Our faculty, and I don't just mean political scientists, I mean our biologists and our engineers and our philosophy faculty and our theology faculty, mm -hmm. everyone across the university can still sort of bring their expertise to help students approach this election from a more informed um, sort of perspective. The students are very much committed to that. The ND Vote students who had so many great ideas um, about what to do around the debate um, were sad for five minutes and then they turned around and they started planning, well, what can we do now um, yeah. to keep this going? That's great. So many have described the current moment as a crisis, right? That we have uh, not only the, the, the pandemic with COVID-19, and the, the economic dislocation, um, huge uh, unemployment rates right now, and then also all of the racial injustice and, 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 um, and violence uh, upheaval that is going on right now in the country. Um, as a political scientist who tries to kind of look historically and learn from the past, how do you, you, how do you balance looking at what you study historically and being attentive to the, the issues of the day. Yeah, and that's always, you know, that's always um, a stressor, but in some sense, um, I, I think there's never been a better moment for um, uh, political science in particular, but, but other things as well. And it's exactly what you just said. How do we understand this movement, this moment, which we're experiencing with so much upheaval, um, with so much sort of uh, nasty politics, et cetera. How do we understand, like, how unique is this? How different is this? And so it's the job, not only of political scientists, but of course of historians and, and so many other scholars on campus to say, these are the ways in which this is historical and different. And these are the ways in which we're seeing recurring patterns. And so, you know, unfortunately patterns of racial injustice and racial violence are not at all new to the United States. And by, by, by looking at um, our issues today in a historic lens, we're able to understand why are these recurring issues? Um, what is going on in terms of power, in terms of, of, of sort of human functioning that, that brings these issues to bear time and time again and how we have steps forward, real steps forward in terms of uh, racial equality and, and racial justice, but we also have steps back. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, what is our, our role in that? Um, as political scientists, um, uh, this is where um, I have to say uh, those of us in American politics have really been learning a lot from our comparative colleagues, our, our friends over in the Kellogg Institute and the Keough School, um, who have really spent a long time thinking about democratic stability, what causes democracies to emerge, but also what 
factors and components undermine good democratic politics. Um, and as we look at our current uh, moment of sort of attacks on the press, uh, attacks on free and fair elections, um, we can look to what we know about democracies and democratic evolution around the world and say, what are we seeing in the United States? Is this just normal partisan bickering or is this something more serious that mm -hmm. all Americans, regardless of their policy preferences or their partisan choices, should be concerned about? That, that for a democracy to function, it needs a free press. It needs yeah. free fair elections. It needs, um, you know, uh, the uh, uh, freedom of voice um, and mm -hmm. assembly. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, it's silver lining again. Nobody likes to live through such a, a, a terrible time, but it's also a, 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 a real teaching moment um, mm -hmm. for thinking about American democracy. Fantastic. Let me ask you one final question, if I could, uh, Christina, and that is, um, Tell us a little bit about our students. You mentioned that they're bright and they're engaging and so forth. In particular, the political science students. Is, is the major thriving? Are the numbers up? Um, what, um, what hope do, do our students bring to you on a regular basis? So uh, we've always had a pretty large number of majors in political science, a lot of Notre Dame students for all, just a huge range of reasons because they have a, a particular cause because they have particular ambitions or interests have been political science majors. That has really accelerated in the last four years. And I, I expect that to increase, that, that students really understand that they're at a unique historic histor uh, political moment and they wanna understand it better and, and they wanna contribute in, in positive ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really where my hope is. So um, even in the midst of this pandemic, um, I'm teaching a big 40 person class. We're actually doing it hybrid. So I meet with 20 of them at a time. Mm -hmm. um, in the midst of all that they're experiencing in the midst of everything that's going on from day one, my students are saying, the reading really connected to this thing that's happening right now, or I was interested to see this, or I already knew this. I'm already so engaged and, and, and so thoughtful in my other classes and in my life that I have you know, important points to bring to the classroom. Um, I, I, I will just speak for myself. There are days during this pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. I have kids at home, uh, that it's really hard to sort of concentrate. And I know that for mm -hmm. our students as well. And I, and I really, I know all of the faculty feel very strongly about being empathetic and compassionate to our students. Mm -hmm. um, but boy, they also just show up and, mm -hmm. and do the work and are ready to go. And that is just uh, such a joy as a teacher. And do you feel that there's a range of debate in the classroom that 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 it's civil and in that that different views are are not only welcome but embraced? It's one of the things I really appreciate about Notre Dame is that our students come to the classroom in, in different uh, from different perspectives, um, from different life experiences. Um, and um, I, I hope, and I certainly endeavor to provide a classroom, and I know my colleagues do as well, where they can sort of um, all bring those perspectives to mind. Um, I've had limited experience uh, teaching elsewhere, and I haven't always encountered that same um, range of opinion and informed mm -hmm. opinion, really coming from, I thought carefully about these issues. Right. Um, and so I, I know there's a lot said about, about colleges these days. Um, uh, we're trying to get students to think uh, and to, to think in new ways. So in some ways, education is always challenging, um, but our students are, are more than up to that task. Well, thank you so much, Christina, for being um, such a terrific shepherd and guide to our students. Um, to, to be here now for 24 years, uh, uh, to get it, dedicate so much of your professional life uh, to the betterment of the students and to play so many roles not just as, as a professor in the political science department, but to, the director of the Rooney Center for American Democracy and also the Hanley, Hanley family director for the Washington DC program. And we're really blessed by your leadership and your service. Uh, you too will be in our prayers uh, as you try to navigate uh, the children at home and, and, the, and the students here in your classroom. We know these are not, uh, um, uh, easy times for, for, for anyone, but uh, we're really grateful uh, for your leadership and your support. Um, we will uh, come back next week. I don't have anybody to announce because I don't want to announce anybody and then see it changed a week from now. But uh, um, our plan is to, uh, to come together uh, for a live chat again uh, next Wednesday. 
uh, around noon, about the same time, we'll, uh, we'll give you a uh, forewarning of that. Um, again, uh, special thanks to Christina. And as, a, as we always do, um, if you would uh, be willing in your home, your workplaces, uh, to join me as we close uh, with, with a Hail Mary. Um, and we pray especially uh, for our students, um, all those who are feeling the anxiety of the moment, both on campus and beyond. And, uh, and we call upon our patroness, Our Lady. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Take care. God bless. Go Irish. Thank you.